Okay. Yeah. So the thing that the content that you shared with us, Stephen, at the beginning is, 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 is also applicable for us in Latin America, no? So we are seeing how the movement of impact investing, understanding this term in a broader sense, no? So investing with impact and investing for impact is gaining momentum in the region. So we are seeing how philanthropists are keen, yeah. how to explore ways in, in, in which their actions and grant resources create more profound and lasting impact. So our perspective from that impact is how we can promote a more catalytic, uh, how we can play a catalytic role for philanthropy and how we can break um, this, the silos, building awareness, fostering new policies and taking risks that um, investors are not ready to take. So how we can promote more testing on improving potential impact business models, how we can support social enterprises that are in the early uh, startup stages. Uh, and it's what we call uh, following the, the EVPA uh, terminology, investing for impact, no? So it is, about, it is all about social investment that prioritizes in impact over financial returns. So um, the idea is that how we can promote in a better way uh, venture philanthropy investing for impact in order to address the capital gap uh, of social purpose organizations uh, that have a highest potential to create social and environmental impact. Um, Latin Pacto is a, is a ancient network we established Latin Pacto this year. And we, we are seeing that, for example, we, we, we see Europe is, is a region, but when we call Latin America, it's, it's actually it's not a real region. We are, we are not well connected as are in, in the countries. We are not um, integrated each other. Uh, we don't have a, a infrastructure and trade and even less in, in terms of the social investment ecosystem. So there is a huge opportunity to, to connect social investors from Mexico to La Patagonia to provide the opportunity of exchange knowledge, best practices and valuable connections to peers with advantage, advantage of, of sharing the, the same language. No, it's, it is an advantage that we have if you compare with other regions, with Asia, even with, with Europe and, and, and Africa. We have one, two languages actually, Spanish and Portuguese. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to be connected with, with, uh, with you, with the largest um, global social investors community that you are gathering uh, from EVPA, ADPN plus the African network. And we're seeing a lot of opportunities of working together. So it, it is just the beginning and, and we need to, to see how this moment in the middle of the pandemic is, is an opportunity how we can enhance the ability for social investors to, to realize their own goals and how we can increase impact. So it's just to mention how we are working, how we want to encourage social investors across the, the region and how we can find more potential partners and opportunities to, to invest in Latin America. So it is my perspective of how the importance of working together with, with you guys and, and I think we can create a lot of changes and, and impact as well. So Frank, could you share with us your perspective from Africa? Yeah, so so first of all, thank you for everyone who's made time to join us today. Um, you, you know, um, Africa has had a very strong connection with the Global North for, for many years um, uh, and it stretches back not necessarily through good history, but you know, from colonial days and a lot of Africans and trade uh, happened across the north and, and south and through the last 60, 70 years there's been strong um, connections between Africa and Europe and Africa and, uh, and North America too. And I, I think as, as people have sought uh, social impact on, on the world, um, you know, the unique uh, talents of social investors who are attracted to challenges basically draw them to Africa and Africa is a, is a, is a strong place for anyone who wants to create global impacts to come and play. There's no better sandbox in the world you'll find than in Africa. And what you find is the, there is a huge synergy between the, the passion and resources coming from the north to the commitments of Africans to want to improve their own lives uh, and create a better future for their, themselves and their kids. So we've seen, for example, a history of uh, um, strong private sector presence of European investors in Africa, so a lot of pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have more European uh, companies and, uh, th than we have American companies, for example. But also from a capital flow perspective, we, we see a lot of the DFIs and the aid coming to Africa 
uh, has, has had a strong flow from, from Europe. Uh, and the question is, you know, how do we uh, make sure we harness this going forward? Uh, and if you look at the biggest challenge we face at the moment in Africa, it's one of, of how do we plug the social financing gap on the continent? So Africa needs between uh, $500 billion to $1.2 trillion annually to close this SDG financing gap. And traditionally, we've, we've depended on aid and, uh, you know, government, uh, uh, government funding through tax to, to plug those holes. But the reality is that aid is reducing at the moment uh, on a per capita level, and our governments are really stretched from a resource perspective. So, so this has really called for um, uh, a rethink and rebooting of how we finance social investments in Africa. And a lot of the models we are we are learning from are coming from uh, you know Asia and Europe in, in many ways, uh, and 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 we we are still um, uh, a bit far behind as as a continent uh, when it comes to uh, impact investing and, uh, and and fundamentally the main reason is not only the lack of capital but also the lack of know-how amongst African social investors. So uh, you might be surprised to know that uh, the whole continent of Africa has only one institution that has any semblance of an innovative financing program. So if you want to do anything in innovative financing in Africa by an African institution, your only option is the University of Cape Town. So those are some of the things that AVP is trying to do is to address that, that lack of capacity and competence amongst African social investors by providing a platform where they can collaborate with each other, but also connect through our sister networks that Stephen is running in Europe and, the, and uh, Carolina in, in Latin America and Nina in Asia, so we can transfer lessons and open up opportunities for co-investment. But there's a really phenomenal opportunity right now for people to not only um, come to Africa to test their models. So, you know, as you all know, Africa is the birthplace for um, mobile money and things like drone transportation of blood. So we have great opportunities uh, due to the challenges we face, but also we have a lot of talent in Africa that's willing to be part of the solution to the future and shaping the future of Africa. So we'll, we'll be looking forward to uh, supporting that network as AVPA, and we have some exciting things we're bringing up in the next couple of months. Thank you. Alan, I think that the Nina's video is ready. Do, do, do you send me a message. Do you want to try again, Alan? Uh, I'm, yes, um, my people want to can you hear me now? Okay, yes, so <laughs> welcome. Glad I could join you all. Um, I assume now you've heard from Carolina as well as Frank. Is that correct? And myself already, Paul, as well. Okay. So next, then, we want to hear from Naina Batra. So Naina is the uh, chair and CEO of the Asia Network. And the questions to uh, the what, what's unique about AVPN, so the Asia Network that Naina runs, is that it actually straddles the global north and the south. And uh, so there's, as you all know, I mean, there's just an immense geography there. And um, for it, AVPN's almost 10 years now, they have actively engaged social investors that are from countries that are among the world's richest, as well as among the, 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 uh, the world's poorest. And they've done that within the context of one, of one network. So the question for Naina really is, so Naina then, as you reflect on the experience of AVPN, what are the key lessons that you look to, to, to you know, that, that, that uh, relate to the experience you have had in creating this, this uh, interchange and collaboration between investors from totally different contexts? And then also, as you reflect on that, how do you see that applying to the uh, global consortium that we're developing now. And so Nana will appear through the miracle of video. All for those questions. Um, in response to your first question, I believe that it is very important for us to know the landscape well. Each market in Asia is growing unevenly. So we at ABPN did a landscape analysis across 14 markets to rate their maturity with respect to social investment from early stage to mature based on a few factors. The presence, contribution, and maturity of all actors in the ecosystem, including government, investors, intermediaries, and nonprofit organizations. We found that this analysis helped our members tremendously as the landscape scan became the baseline for them to assess the market's development challenges 
attractiveness and opportunities for investment, along with legislative influence and recent trends. We also made it easier for our members to compare between markets based on various considerations so that they could make more informed decisions. There is a growing culture of cross-border giving in Asia, and having these insights have been extremely useful for our members as they decide to move capital from the more established economies like Japan or Korea to economies that are still sort of, um, you know, maturing or in a phase of economic development like Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines. It's also important, I believe, to have boots on the ground. Upon knowing the nuances across the different markets, the next challenge is finding the right partner and scale your impact. There is no one size that fits all solution when you have to address local challenges. So boots on the ground are critical in advising the efficacy of an impact solution. And that's where I believe the power of networks come in. Networks play the role of an ecosystem builder by providing an infrastructure or you know, a, a, a kind of foundation to connect new entrants with seasoned practitioners who can then learn best practices from each other. They also help to facilitate multi-sector partnerships and encourage innovative solutions that oftentimes come from unlikely allies. We also find that networks like AVPN introduce local market intermediaries to funders and resource providers from different countries and different markets who can provide advisory services and add the most important context to how they can adapt global solutions to the local market. The third thing that I think is important is to nurture a learning community. The learning never stops, especially when leading a network. We must be a few steps ahead of our members to ensure that they're receiving the best services from us. It is important to meet everyone where they are. And so we have launched recently two fellowships. One is an impact investing fellowship and the other one is a leadership fellowship. These are looking to support asset owners and wealth managers to build an impact driven portfolio, um, you know, across the continuum of capital. At the same time, we also have the AVPN Academy, which encourages practitioners from across the continuum to share their insights and case studies to better equip newer social investors. Members finally must feel a sense of ownership in their network to contribute resources and be empowered. I believe that as global challenges become more interconnected and complex, there's no way any single organization, government or network can work alone. We need to harness the strength of being the network of networks, but we know that collaboration is not easy. So it is important that we build up a systems level framework. We build up trust and accountability to bring multi stakeholders effectively together. Why I think we are at an advantage to do this is because I think the four RMAs effectively share the same DNA and the same purpose, which can be an important first step in building collaboration and building a strong partnership amongst the four regional associations to uh, de deliver what I would believe is a global proposition. Finally, I think, uh, what sets this group apart is what I mentioned in my first part of my answer is that all these four networks are distinctly connected on the ground in the geographies where they operate. So they have boots on the ground and together they can form a very, very vital global framework. So thank you, Naina. Um, reflecting on that, what I'd like to start, and, and actually I need a question here too. So could, could somebody tell me where we are in terms of the time period for the session? We, we have, have 30 minutes. I'm sorry, we have 30 more minutes? Yeah. Is that right? right? Okay, good, good. So we're, uh, what we're going to do now is, uh, let's say, uh, 15 minutes of moderated discussion just amongst the, the, the speakers, and then we definitely want to open it up for questions from the audience, which uh, we will do uh, moderated through our partner, uh, Alan. 
Um, but where I'd like to start is, uh, since the three of you have already spoken to your own particular issues, uh, reflecting on what Nana was just saying about the kind of the key lessons that ABPN has learned in trying to facilitate this this um, cross culture, mm -hmm. cross economic um, collaboration. So she highlighted uh, the importance of knowing the landscape and being able to provide information, uh, building a culture of cross border giving, um, and then also uh, the, the importance of, of having shared DNA among these networks that actually involves boots on the ground. So this is not all three of the networks represented here are not just like conceptual, you know, uh, what's impact, what's capital to capital. It's about really driving investors to action. So as you reflect on those factors that Nana was highlighting, um, what I, I'd like to hear any of the three of you actually address your interpretation of those factors as applied to the, the, the grand global consortium that we're in the process of, of trying to build now. Yes, for example, in our case that we're a nascent network in Latin America, we are seeing a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, connecting with the existing networks, with Europe and Asia. And it is true that Nina mentioned that we are sharing the same DNA. So how we can improve these connections, these listeners, and how we can connect also the peers in Latin America. So how we can adapt this knowledge into Latin America is how we are promoting different initiatives take into advantage the, the lessons learned from our sister networks. And now is how we can connect in a better way the, the investors across the globe. Because we are seeing with the COVID that the needs is not only happening in one region or one specific aid country. We, we are sharing the same challenges right now. So if we can learn, we can leverage our connections and also how we can improve and mobilize more capitals and more capital towards impact. And if I can add to that, uh, Paul, um, I could see benefits on three levels. The first level is where, as coming together, as Nina was saying, um, we can bring direct benefit for our members, all of our members that have yeah. cross-regional aspiration. And it's both on coordination of cross-regional flows and interchanging information. It's running global programs that could benefit not on you know, COVID, but on other programs mm -hmm. as well, where we have indeed the, the local kind of sensitivities, but run it as global programs. These are benefits that can come directly to our members. But there are a couple of other benefits. I think that impact is at the heart now of many discussions, whether it's government, whether it's mainstream investors, whether it's large corporations, they all talk about impact. What is very specific about the VPSI and the Invest for Impact community is that they start from the beneficiary, that they start from the impact. And in order to preserve that impact lens, it is crucial that other global players like corporates, like the United Nations, like mainstream investors also have this voice around the table. So coming together mm -hmm. as different RMAs and joining forces will also give us one face and one voice to make sure that impact is front and center in the broader dialogue with all the other stakeholders. And that's crucial to preserve that kind of uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So Frank, if I could uh, uh, go back to you, uh, there was one particular aspect that, that Nana mentioned that seems especially relevant to, to uh, Africa as a potential barrier, which would be the you know, the, the creation of a culture of cross-border giving. So could could you speak to that be, and, and and maybe where kind of the, the, the state of, of uh, Africa uh, ph philanthropy and uh, impact investing and how, how you feel that AVPA may be able to influence that? Yeah, um, so, so it, you know, Africa comes with these complexities of being 54 countries uh, with multiple languages, uh, different people and all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, I think there's an underlying um, uh, kind of very uh, thread that goes through Africans and that's the, the need and passion for helping each other is very common. Um, but, but nonetheless, I, I think I want to echo what Nena said around 
uh, first of all, understanding uh, the problem we're trying to solve and what you're trying to deal with. Um, and and to, to, to that end, I think um, we need to be careful that we don't uh, treat African countries as, as one big country. They're all very, very different. Um, so very, very important that we, we try and understand the uniqueness of, of the big markets and recognizing that there's a couple of markets that are influential at a regional level and they tend to shape how those regions behave. Um, uh, and and we're, we're seeing Africans recognizing that the, the, the nature of our diversity of number of countries has also worked against us. So the free trade agreement, for example, is one attempt at trying to make sure that movement of, of resources, capital and trade in Africa is made easier. And I, I see that will, will become um, even more seamless when we look at other downstream benefits of things like uh, philanthropy uh, happening across. Uh, and, and the other thing that we're seeing that's, uh, that's happening at a cross-border level, driven mainly by corporate corporates that are um, um, multinational in nature on the African continent, is their foundations tend to work across multiple countries. So whether you're looking at the Coca-Cola Africa Foundation, for example, mm -hmm. and a couple of others, they will tend to work across multiple countries. Uh, but in, still in that context, I think those players struggle with having that network which they can plug into with other local players um, to really maximize their impact. Um, and, and, and that ability to connect with local people uh, understand local circumstances at, at a country level, um, bring in your expertise, but also learn from them. And at the same time, be open mm -hmm. to understanding perspectives from other parts of the world is lacking. And I, that's where AVPA is trying to plug a hole, is, is to, 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 to bring that opportunity for uh, these investors to collaborate, but also the different types of investors, because we know right now that uh, we don't have enough money in the social space in Africa. So we need to see how we can bring private sector capital into the social sector. So mm -hmm. how do we bring us together uh, the con what we call the continuum of capital? So grant makers, debt providers, and equity to, for, for greater collaboration. So, so, so that's kind of where we're doing. And I'm glad to say that Africa has also just finished our landscape study, which will be out in the next two weeks. So anyone who's listening and keen to hear from us, please get in touch. So Stephen, question for you uh, that builds on what Frank was just saying about the, you know, have, Frank having mentioned specifically multinational corporations and, and the, the potentially distinctive role that they have in Africa, uh, especially I would, I guess I would add in the, in the absence of what is now truly a robust kind of philanthrop private philanthropic sector. You've done quite a lot of work with corporations in the context of, of their giving well beyond uh, social uh, responsibility. So could you please address just your, your thinking on the corporate sector and the opportunity that they provide based in your, on your experience in, in Europe, but also then is extended to this global community? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, of course, as I said in the beginning, social innovation very often is a very local thing. Uh, so we need many local players to address those social issues. Mm. But there are also uh, issues which are much more on a global level and there are actors on a global level. And I think out of whether we take government, the social sector and the corporate space, I think the corporate space is the most globalized space of all. Mm -hmm. And hence what we see is when we started to develop a corporate program in Europe that um, we were investigated how corporates, through corporate giving, through their corporate foundation, through their corporate impact funds, could design and define a holistic impact strategy, all geared towards purpose. Sorry, no. there it is. Now, <laughs> um, and very soon when we entered the discussion of how could a company that's traveling the journey towards an inclusive business, how a corporate foundation which is traveling the journey towards venture philanthropy and social investing, how could they come together into this um, joint idea of purpose? We quickly kind of bumped into the barrier that companies like Essilor, they're all over the space. Essilor even clearly stated to us, yes, we might have been French from origin, but we are now far more active working with the BOP in Asia. Other companies like CNA, they're active in Latin America. Also those global companies, if they're serious about their impact footprint, they want to have a coherent picture and a concise strategy. And that's where, uh, as one of the most globalized actors uh, dealing with impact, I think that uh, if we can uh, provide also this corporate uh, landscape 
a good journey on their global uh, way towards impact as uh, some of our MAs that we could uh, accelerate, uh, let's say, the, the needle towards uh, uh, more impact uh, altogether. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to change um, uh, speeds a little bit here and uh, think about uh, more, more directly catalytic capital and especially venture philanthropy as an element of catalytic capital. Uh, you know, the fact is that while all of these networks address a wide range of social investors, the roots of this particular model are in, in venture philanthropy and venture philanthropists, of course, like conventional philanthropists or strategic philanthropists are investors who for the most part are ready to lose all their money in order to advance a particular social purpose, which puts them in a very, very special category of, of, um, of deployment of capital. And um, I think it's fair to say that in some respects, as the in impact investment movement has grown, to some degree, uh, philanthropists or venture philanthropists have taken sort of a back seat in terms of the prestige and certainly the attention and excitement and that sort of thing. But what we are now finding is that philanthropists or venture philanthropists who are truly ready to lose their money in order to make things happen that could not happen with a for-profit model are actually now represented among the most valuable capital in the entire social landscape. And so in that context, I'd like to hear any of you, maybe Caroline is, is starting with you since, since uh, uh, you, you, it's your turn in a sense, <laughs> but, but any of you really, to think about the distinctive role now that venture philanthropy can play in the context of developing deals as part of a, you know, a, a truly catalytic capital or blended capital uh, uh, approach to de developing extraordinary opportunities. Thoughts? Yes, so, so thank you for, for, for this question. I think it's, it's really important to see that. And I, I, I would prefer to talk about the, how we can integrate the continuum of capital, is how we're integrating the traditional philanthropies with the social invest, you know, with, with, the, with the impact investing market. No, it's, it's how we can connect both worlds and how we are applying um, more strategic approaches to, to deploy your capital, no? uh, with an with a impact first approach. So it's, it's something that we want to connect. Uh, we are seeing a lot of philanthropists right now that uh, with the pandemic that they are seeing, okay, how can I deploy my capital in a more strategic way? So we are seeing that the approach of investing for impact or venture philanthropy is the way that we can um, we can we can we can share with them, and is the way that we how we can connect and how we can understand that it's not only just giving financial resources, it's not only giving grants, it's how you mm -hmm. can connect with non-financial support, is how you can measure your impact as well. So I think that the three elements of venture philanthropy that is is. Uh, giving financial resources is not is giving non-financial resources and and is is measuring your 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 impact is the way that you can you can really create an impact. So we are seeing right now with the pandemic a lot of opportunities to to continue teaching with athletes because mm -hmm. we are promoting with the four networks different trainings and it's how we are connecting these philanthropies is, is because it's the way that they can they can be connected and, and I'm seeing one of the questions mm -hmm. here in the chat. That is where I can see this, where I can find all these deals that are happening, how I can connect with my peers. So it's, it's something that we are doing with our networks. It's, it's improving, mm -hmm. for example, Asia, they already have the, the deal share platform. It's something that Asia, Africa is, is, is trying to implement a pilot. And we're also trying to, to create the same connections with, with, with Latin America. We cannot continue working in an isolated way. We need to being connected and, uh, and applying the, the best uh, uh, tools to have a more strategic uh, approach and create impact. Great, thank you, Carolina. Uh, would either of you like to address that too before we go to the audience uh, Q&A? Stephen or Frank? Well, I would just want to re-emphasize what I said before, um, because impact is becoming such an important topic which is discussed worldwide i just elaborated a bit that corporates many of them are globalized mainstream capital is globalized money goes in seconds throughout the world but 
if in this entire impact discussion we don't keep this angle of venture philanthropy and investing for impact mm -hmm. we might collude and might kind of confuse as well uh, the whole narrative so i think it is important that um yeah in this global narrative yeah. the voice of investors for impact is clearly heard and sits around the table yeah frank yeah, Paul, I, I, I think for me, I, I say the, the philanthropists or venture philanthropists are the bridesmaids in the equation to save Africa in many ways. If we've got to crowd in private sector capital because we, haven't, we don't have enough of social uh, sector capital, we need the philanthropists to view their role differently. We need them to think um, differently about how they deploy capital um, and um, diversify uh, uh, into catalytic capital investments away from being traditional philanthropists. And, and I think that that will make a big difference for us to uh, be able to tap into the 250 million dollar, uh, 250 million trillion dollar uh, uh, capital markets for, for additional capital. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, one of the things that AVP will be doing is to work to with um, uh, the, the philanthropists to see how we can help them diversify the investment, uh, become more catalytic capital, and that doesn't mean that they abandon their their, their grant obligation where necessary. But it's about diversification and invest alongside other mainstream partners. Um, so we'll be looking to do that. But also, as, as Carolina mentioned, our deal share platform, which we'll also be piloting in about seven to ten days, will help make that blending of capital more more possible and a lot more uh, seamless. So we are going to be offering opportunities for um, providers of the various types of capital, from debt, equity, and grants, to collaborate around specific deals because we know at certain point grants are more suitable and that others mainstream capital uh, works better. So there are all these things we're hoping to do and help them make better decisions in supporting the flow of capital into Africa. Excellent. Well, with that, why don't we uh, make the transition then to taking questions from the audience. Um, and um, I'll ask Alan um, to, to uh, suggest to us um, a particular question that, that uh, he has found especially interesting. Hi, Paul. Yes, Chad is asking, um, or he's noting that um, funding options are very disorganized and even hard to find in the South. So he wonders what's your, or what are the panelists' opinion about centralized information for finding uh, funding sources and streaming, streaming application processes? So I think it's something we are talking about uh, with the with the deal share platform is how we are sharing and who are gathering all this information yep, yep. and how we are connecting the four RMAs, the Europe, Europe Asia, yeah. Africa, Latin America. So I think it's the best way to, to connect because we have a lot of platforms right now, but we don't have a platform, for example, in the case of Latin America, we don't have any platform yet that connects social investors. We are, have a lot of uh, networks connecting entrepreneurs, and people asking for mm -hmm. money, but we don't have yet a place that a marketplace for investors. Yeah, that's an excellent distinction, Carolina. And Frank, would would you like to elaborate on that? Because again, uh, Africa is preparing within the next couple of weeks to actually launch its deal player deal share platform. Yeah, yeah, Paul. I I, I think I think the. That, that's a very um, important um, thing is 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 the platforms one to not just connect social investors but help them uh, grow and learn uh, and move best practice across because one of, one of the most frustrating things operating in Africa is that in many cases we are solving the same problems across borders and we are re re we are re reinventing the wheel repeatedly um, and not looking to also think about scaling some of our our solutions beyond one country so they can go bigger and attract more capital and, and so so what, what the deal share platform would, will enable um uh to happen in africa is not only uh, support the whole value chain of, of potential deals from early stage where they may require more higher risk uh, capital like grants to to you know growth uh, investments to uh, scale scale opportunities but also um try and look at how we can support some of these investors think beyond the single small market countries. And in so doing, we can build bigger investment opportunities uh, that, that are more pan-African uh, 
uh, and that can then in days to come really become pan-African conglomerates in many ways, many ways. So, so this is the kind of stuff we're hoping to create. Great, thank you. Alan, next. Uh, Judith wants to know how venture philanthropy should and should not work alongside other forms of catalytical capital. So Stephen, do you want to take that one? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, quite a difficult one because then we go a little bit into definitions of catalytic capital and yeah. venture philanthropy. Um, what do you think, Paul? Should we enter that discussion or? Well, I, I, I mean, what 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 actually occurs to to me as a, as a just a starting point in that in that that dialogue is. Um, really thinking about what uniquely philanthropic capital can do because there are some things there are some places some ways that it can displace for-profit capital and which is not productive or where it can complicate for-profit capital markets which is not productive but there are other some other instances or other types of applications for which it is absolutely unique addressing problems that don't have a uh, efficacious revenue model or uh, addressing super early stage uh, investments that that can't attract for-profit venture capital because the rates of return will never be uh you know in line with the risk profile etc cetera, etc cetera. so um uh, that's that's what occurs that, that's what occurs to me i mean any other thoughts th thoughts on that I, yeah, yeah. Paul, Paul, that, 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 that's what I read into that question. I think it's an issue of, 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 of if you think about uh, structuring the right capital at the right time of an investment, uh, and, and how do you use, um, uh, for example, philanthropic capital to, 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 to prove uh, concepts and prove solutions when the risk for failure is very, very high? And how do you deliberately tie that, uh, that application of philanthropic capital to the next level a patient capital investor, the following investor. Um, and, and, and I think that's kind of how we need to think of because there, there are times when, um, you know, it's high risk, you will, uh, as a philanthropist, you, as you think about building um, uh, and supporting uh, social solutions to come to life, that you, you, you will, you'll deploy capital as grants knowing you might, you might not get it back. But also we, we know increasingly that there are options of you deploying it as convertible um, uh, grants where possible, um, but, but plugging into uh, knowing when 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 is also the right time for you to just give a grant and not expect any any fall on capital, or when when yeah. do you provide a grant and you are connected like on a network that, that all of us are sitting on right now to the next follow on investor who can provide the next level of commercial capital to then bring the real sustainable value from the investment you've made, yeah. and and I think that's very, that's very possible based on on what we 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 on this platform are able to bring to to the to the ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you. Alan, next. Felipe Gomez is wondering if retail investors could play a bigger role in bringing more money going forward. Okay. I think so, yes, but I'm currently involved in trying to make sure that when retail investors, of course, still today, retail investors um, and even uh, consumers um still represent a big part of of the investment pie but what is lacking is um the transparency and the credibility that if they go for a certain uh, investment or a certain spo and it's still small scale you can't do the proper due diligence you can't do the proper follow-up and so on and so forth so a more transparent setting where we built system where retailers can come and retail investors can come and credibly invest in areas where impact is also part of the game will need uh, much better um, I would say uh, checks and balances on the investment uh, or investee level and that's where even in, in a European setting UK is big time trying 
um, to bring retail investors on board. Uh, but we need a bit more uh, checks and balances and, and uh, yeah, transparency in when true impact is, is delivered. Right. Alan, next. The last question we have is about uh, measuring social impact. And um, so the question Lina makes makes is how we can build a common framework about impact to make it easier uh, for investors and other stakeholders. So, I, 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 I'll speak a bit from what I see in Africa. Um, I, I think this is still a space that uh, requires some work. Um, St Stephen has probably done a bit more than the rest of us in Europe uh, based on just creating some framework but I know in Africa we still have a lot of, a long way to go to create frameworks that standardize uh, impact measurement and create a common language amongst the social investors uh, ecosystem so so it's, it's something that we will also be looking to learn from uh, our, um, Stephen and, and network in the north uh, to see what what can we take and translate to stuff that would work in Africa as we support local innovators who are also trying to come up with similar things here um, I just recently we were involved with uh, uh, an organization called uh, Impact, uh, the Impact Alliance. They have a tool called ICS, which is used by fund managers to classify the social impact of their fund. And so as, as, a, as an investor, you can, you can choose the fund manager based on whether his fund is classified as A, B or C, and with A being a very uh, socially responsible fund. Uh, but I think for us, we have a, a quite a way to do with that. Yes, but Frank, I think that in my perspective is, is, is what, I, what I think is, I think that we have a lot of uh, very good uh, methodologies right now to measure impact. So I, I, I would prefer not, I think our role uh, or my role in, 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 from Latin impact is how we can promote these methodologies is, is not having a, a single framework, is how we can promote uh, any specific uh, different methodologies to measure impact. But I think there is a lot of good uh, methodologies right now. And actually in, in SOCAP, they are presenting different methodologies. So this is the way how we can promote measuring impact instead of saying, okay, this is, this is the methodology that we will adapt because there are different perspectives and different investors. I don't yeah. know, Steven, what is your point of view? Yeah, very quickly, our learning uh, as investors for impact is that measurement is not even half of the pie. It's the impact management, which is very more, very much important because being investors for impact, you're close to the beneficiaries. You have to be agile. It's about social innovation. So um, spending a lot of time and rigor to impact measurement uh, will not bring you there. Uh, so as investors with impact, which is a different class, you need on this transactional base, very rigorous and transparent metrics. But as investors for impact, uh, impact management is definitely more than half of the effort. So I don't know if we are being held to the initial uh, uh, schedule, but we have hit uh, the, the uh, scheduled end of this session. Uh, but before we go, uh, the first and most important thing I want to say is that to my understanding, we do not get cut off. So if any of you would like to continue to ask questions, then we are happy to, you know, to uh, accommodate you because this is what we do and this is what we care about. And we're very excited about, you know, the opportunity that we feel we have to leverage all of these networks to, you know, to truly create a global community. I would also just like to, for the record, just to you know, apologize for the uh, uh, dysfunctionality created by the technical problems, especially to, the, to, to any extent to which the unique problems I was experiencing complicated the session. But um, I, I certainly hope all of you, uh, through the resilience of our panel, have been able to you know, get a good sense of what this, this movement is all about. So that, uh, if, if you need to go, Thank you very much, and we look forward to to uh, engaging with you through whatever you know process makes sense, especially as it serves your needs. We will be here in whatever continent uh, you you uh, operate, either because that's where you are or where you want to invest. Uh, but again, if for any of you who want to continue to ask questions, then we will continue to answer them. So thank you all very very much. 
So, um, Alan, are, are we are we still getting some some questions here? It's very odd not to be able to have any sense of the audience, but no, not at the moment. And <laughs> I think okay, they, they can even request uh, being on camera, and uh, we also invite them to do it. On the top right, there's a blue button if you want to speak directly to one of the panelists. Well, I, I think then if, if we're not getting any more questions, then I would just invite our panelists to make any closing uh, comments that any of the three of you would, would like to make. And then uh, we'll see if we get any, uh, any further comments. Carolina? Yes, no, actually we'll have more questions, but I just want to say that uh, the good thing that we, I want to highlight is that we are here as a network. So it is a movement that will continue. We are improving our connections, our ways of collaborations with the four AMAs and with our networks across the globe. So it's how we can improve impact. I, see, I think this is, 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 is our mission and we want to work together uh, with all the participants as part of this, this community of uh, improving impact. So, yeah. Uh, just as Thank a concluding you. remark, maybe from my side, we've come a long way and it's normal. You have to first grow your own network and feel comfortable and kind of deal with your problems on the ground, which is the most important thing. The time has come that we feel confident and that we are maturing and that more and more members are asking to speak up and to get organized on a global level. So time is right to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Frank. And just from my side, I think I think the last couple of years, we've, the world has learned some harsh lessons that uh, we do, we no longer have regional problems. All our problems are global. Um, COVID being one of them, the refugee crisis in Europe being another. Uh, so uh, we we have to work collaboratively uh, as a global system or ecosystem of social investors to try and solve this problem at root cause wherever we can. And this takes us to have uh, close collaborations across regions um, with with having you know one one lens and one eye on the global issues but another with with tight feet on the ground to be able to implement uh, locally and i think this is what we're trying to achieve with these four networks that cover the, the, the world uh, uh, at scale so we're, we're very happy thank you for joining us and uh, we're hoping you'll find a partner in either all of us or one of us for sure great well that's a pretty good wrap up i think for the whole session so uh, again thank thank you all um out there wherever you are and whatever you're interested in, uh, the final thing I would just emphasize about all of these networks is that if it was not already uh, apparent, they are they have no agenda other than to serve social investors and to help make social investors more effective um, in achieving the aspirations that all of you uh, have for yourselves and for your own philanthropy and for your in own investment. Uh, there's no separate agenda other than to uh, help you uh, work together um, to make the world a better place. Uh, so thank you all for your uh, time and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Paul. Take care. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you, Stephen and Frank. Thank you. Thank you, bye.